In this section we're going to talk about a specific kind of probability distribution which is a binomial probability distribution. A binomial probability distribution is one that fits four different criteria. The first one is that there has to be a fixed number of trials. So I have to know exactly how many times I'm going to do something or exactly how many people I'm going to look at. Each trial has to have two possible outcomes. That's where the binomial comes from. The trials have to be independent. What happens on one try does not change what might happen on the next try and then the probabilities have to be the same every time. So whatever the probability of it happening on the first time is, it's the same probability on the fifth time. So we're going to look at a few examples just to see what I mean by those four different requirements. So let's say we're going to flip a coin 100 times. Well, first of all, we do have a fixed number of trials. We're going to do it 100 times. We know how many times we're going to do it. There are two possible outcomes. Each time I could either get heads or tails. Each flip of the coin is independent. If I get heads on the first time, that doesn't change the fact that I still might get heads or tails on the next time. And the probabilities are the same. First time I flip a coin, 50% chance of getting heads. Second time I flip a coin, still 50% chance of getting heads. They're all the same. So yes, this would create a binomial probability distribution. Now if I decide that I'm going to flip a coin until I get heads for the first time, well, that's already failed the first requirement. There are not a fixed number of trials here because I don't know exactly how many times that's going to take. So this one would not create a binomial probability distribution. Rolling a die 60 times. Well, there are a fixed number of trials. We're doing it exactly 60 times. However, there are not two outcomes. You actually have six outcomes, one through six when you're rolling dice. So that would not create a binomial probability distribution. Um, now actually you could reframe this to be binomial. Let's say you're only interested in how many times you roll a four. Well then you could frame this as two different categories. You either roll a four or you don't roll a four. So you could make this binomial if you wanted to. However in this case we're just writing down whatever number we happen to roll. That's too many possibilities, not binomial. Looking at the genders of three children, if you're going to have three children, first, second, third. There are a fixed number of trials. We're looking at definitely three children. Assuming that we're only looking at boy versus girl and not one of those chromosomal anomalies that can cause some other things to happen. If we're assuming that we're just doing boy versus girl, then there are two possible outcomes. Each birth is independent. If I have a boy on my firstborn, that does not change the fact that it's a boy versus a girl on the second child. And the chance of boy or girl is the same each time. If you assume it's 50-50, 50% chance of a boy on the first child, still a 50% chance on the second. So yes, this does meet all four criteria. It is going to create a binomial probability distribution. And recording the ethnicity for 200 students in a particular degree program. Well, we do have a fixed number of trials. Here, trials refers to the number of students that we're going to look at. So we do have 200. That's a fixed number. But there's probably more than two ethnicities that they're looking at, so more than two possible outcomes. So this would not create a binomial probability distribution. A little bit of notation for when we're working with binomials. Uh, we call what we want to have happen a success. So the probability of a success, for short, we just call it lowercase p. Probability of that not happening, or of it being a failure, is lowercase q. Now those are complements, and so we remember from our complement rule that they should add up to 100%. So once I have the probability of a success, I can do 1 minus that to find the probability of a failure. Now, the terminology success and failure refers to whatever it is that we're counting is a success. So if I'm counting the number of deaths, then a success is actually a death. So the terminology here can be a little strange. Keep that in mind. We're going to use an N to stand for the number of trials. Remember, trials can be how many times I do something, or it can be how many people I'm looking at. X is the total number of times I want to see something happen. Lowercase p is the probability of that happening each time. Q we talked about is the probability of it not happening, probability of a failure. 
and then p of x is the probability of it happening the number of times that we want it to. Keep in mind as you're doing these that x and p should be talking about the same thing. So if x is counting the number of heads, then p should be the probability of flipping heads. They should always be talking about the same thing. Let's just look at a quick example here to get used to this notation. So we're tossing a coin a hundred times and counting heads. That means a success is flipping heads. Lowercase x would be counting the number of times you flipped heads in that hundred times. You might have x be a specific number that you want to see heads. n is a hundred times. p is the chance each time of flipping heads. So 50-50 chance, we have a 50% chance each time of flipping heads, so that's our p. What we're interested then is if we know the probability of something happening each time, so now out of a hundred times what's the probability that I get heads 30 of those tries? We've got a pretty complicated formula here that we can use to figure that out, uh, but we're not going to use this. If you were in a more advanced probability course you might we're actually going to have a calculator program that does this for us. We're going to use that and then we'll focus on interpreting our results. So I'll make another calculator video to walk through this in more detail, but I've got some screenshots here to give you the basic idea. And what I'm going to focus on here is we have a couple of different calculator programs to use, so I'm going to talk about when to use each one and how. So first calculator program finds exactly what I was just talking about. Out of say a hundred tries, what's the probability of getting heads 30 of those hundred times? So we use something called the binomial probability distribution function in your calculator. We've got a new menu that we need to find. So find the VARS button on your calculator and we're actually going to do the distribution menu right above it. So second VARS gets you into this menu and we want the two binomial ones, so they're down a ways, 0 and A. In this case we're using binome PDF, binomial probability distribution function. That is going to compute the probability of out of so many tries, what's the probability of getting exactly this many. This program needs to know three different things. It needs to know n, p, and x. n is the number of trials, p is the probability of whatever you're looking at each time, and then x is the number of times you want to see it happen. And then you put commas in between those three and then close the parentheses. Or with the newer TI-84s you'll get a pop-up screen that asks for trials, which is n, and then it'll ask for p and the x value, and you'll just fill those in and then hit paste. Okay, so let's say we're flipping that coin a hundred times. We want to know the probability of getting heads 40 times. So I would go to the binome PDF, and then I'd type in a hundred trials, 0.5 chance of getting heads each time, and I want to know the probability of getting heads 40 times. Make sure that you put your probabilities in as decimals, not percentages. So you can't put in 50, you have to put in 0.5. And then the calculator will churn that out for you. Remember with probabilities we need three significant digits. Those don't start counting until you actually get to a number. So you don't start counting until you get to the 1. So our probability would be 0 0.0108. What about something that's not a 50-50 chance? Not everything is. So let's say we roll a die four times and we want to know the probability of getting one three of those times. Um, remember, even though rolling a die is six possible numbers, we can count this as binomial if we say I either roll a one or I don't. So n would be four. We're going to roll the die four times. p is we're we want to know the probability of getting a 1 each time. So on each roll we've got six possible numbers. I could get a 1. One of them is a 1. So 1 out of 6 chance of getting a 1 each time. And then X says I want that to happen three of those four times. So I'd go to the binome PDF and I'd put in 4, 1 -sixth, and 3. You can put in fractions with the divide button. So 1 6th and 3 and then I'd round that off to 0 0.0154 or I could say 1.54 percent. 
But what if I don't just want to know the probability that it happens three times, I want the probability that it happens up to three times. That's actually more than one probability. That would be the probability of getting it 0, 1, 2, or 3. You can use the PDF function and add those three together, but if you're talking about big numbers, that can take a while. So we have another program on the calculator called the cumulative binomial function, binom CDF for cumulative, and it will add several together for us. So for this one, you go into second vars again, scroll down, find binom CDF. CDF finds the probability of whatever number you say or less. So it will add up the probability of that one and all the probabilities less than that. Binom CDF needs the same three pieces of information, N, P, and X. Or on the newer calculators with the pop-up, it'll ask for trials, P, and X, which are the same three things. I'm going to run through an example. It'll help us tell when to use PDF versus CDF and then how to use CDF because you have to be careful with that. All right, Curtis accidentally walks into the LSAT uh, instead of the ACT. Randomly guesses on all 30 questions in the first section. Each question was multiple choice, five possible answers. So the first question is, will this produce a binomial distribution? Can we use binom PDF and binom CDF on this situation? Well, we have 30 trials because there's 30 questions. Two possibilities on each. Even though it's a multiple choice question with five possible answers, we're really only interested in whether he got it right or wrong. So correct or incorrect, yes, two possibilities. Um, it is independent. Getting one question right doesn't change what's going to happen on the next one. And we do have the same chance of getting each question right because they all have five choices with one correct. So this will be a probability, binomial probability distribution. And specifically, what is that P? What is the chance on each question of getting it right? Five multiple choice answers, one is correct. That's one out of five or 0.2 chance for each question of getting it right. All right, so what's the probability that he gets exactly 20 questions correct? Well, getting exactly 20 correct is a binome PDF situation. So if you want to try putting this in your calculator, you can pause the video and go try this. Um, so binome PDF, and then we need to do N, P, and X. N is 30 questions. We just figured out that P was 0.2 chance of getting each one right, and we want to know the chance of getting 20 right. Now the calculator spits out something that looks pretty crazy on this one. 3.38, blah, 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 and then there's this E negative 8. That's actually the calculator's way of writing scientific notation. So that's really 3.38, blah, 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 times 10 to the negative 8th. You can either write it that way, or you can move the decimal point eight places to the left, which I've done for my final answer there. And then three significant digits would go 338. If you wanted to leave it in scientific notation, your three significant digits would still count the first three. So it'd be 3.38 times 10 to the negative eighth. And I will take those either way. I will not accept answers with the E in them. So if you want to leave it in scientific notation, that's fine, but make sure you change it to times 10 to the negative eighth. Okay, so what's the probability of getting at most 20 correct? So at most 20 means 20 or anything smaller than that, so 20 or less. That is actually exactly what binome CDF calculates for us. So I would go find binome CDF. Go ahead and pause this if you want to try this on your own. Binome CDF, I'm going to put 30 tries, 0.2 chance of correct on each try, and I want to know 20 or less. Now that comes out to point nine 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 nine, going on quite a ways with a 6, and this brings up an important point about the rounding rule. Usually we do three significant digits, but with this one, if we rounded to three significant digits, the 9 in the next spot would actually round it up, and this would end up being 1.0, and you really don't want to write that because that makes it look like a 100% chance, which it is not. So it's better to keep all of the digits in this case. Now this is a tricky one. You want to pay close attention to this one. What is the probability that he got at least 20 correct? Well, we 20 at least 20 means 20 or more, right? At least means that number or bigger. 
We actually don't have a calculator program that does that. Binome CDF only finds 20 or less. We don't have anything that finds 20 or more. So we're going to need to tweak this one a little bit. We're actually going to use complements to figure this out. Remember, complements are like opposites. I can't find or more, but I can find or less. So if I could find the opposite or the complement, I know what to do with complements. So if I want 20 or more, the complement would be 19 or less. The opposite would not include the 20. Since the 20 is included in what we want, the complement would not have the 20 in it. So it would be 19 or less for the complement. Well, if I can find the probability of that, then I can just subtract it from 100%. So that's what we're going to do. So we'll do 1 minus the probability of 19 or less. All right, well, I can do less. That's a binome, CDF. So I'll do 1 minus binome CDF. 30.219 because that's the one I'm finding, the complement. And you can actually just type that whole thing in your calculator, 1 minus binome CDF, blah, blah, blah. And then that will give you another scientific notation answer. And I've moved the decimal point to the left and put in the zeros. So that would be the answer on that one.